I'm going to ask Dr. Tima Knight. Dr. Knight is our uh, CASCI director for Alabama and an adjunct professor, our Extension Center director. Dr. Knight, lead us in prayer, please. Thank you, Dr. Knight. Yeah, let's pray and pray for Dr. Smith, who's coming back to speak to us. I, when I introduced him in class just a little while ago, I said, I've known him since 2001, and there has never been a conversation we've had in person or on the phone that he hasn't prayed for me. And so now it's an honor to pray for him as he comes to speak to us. Let's pray together. Spirit of the living God, fill this place with your power. Touch our hearts. Open our minds that we would hear your word and obey your word. That we would be servant leaders to follow whenever you nodded us. That we would be uh, men and, and, and women that would live as servants to the most high king. And Father, just help us. Help us in our ministry, wherever it is. Help us to touch the lives of people, to plunder hell in order to populate heaven, that you would be glorified, and that men and women and boys and girls would come into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And Father, now bless my brother, Dr. Robert Smith. Use him in a mighty way to touch our hearts and to challenge us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's, uh, let's try to come close to completing um, what the Lord has laid on my heart concerning the 23rd Psalm. I want to talk about precious memories, and I want to address or treat verses 4 through 6. Verses 4 through 6. Helmut Thielicke, German theologian from Hamburg, Germany, in his Notes from a Wayfarer, which is his autobiography, says on the last page, page 419, we are admittedly only guests on this beautiful planet. Wayfarers on call and with sealed orders in which the day and hour of our departure are recorded. Our departure is certainly not easy. I would have loved to have stayed here longer, but the wagon's moving on. As Christians, we are certain that the lifespan allotted to us is an advent of a still greater fulfillment. The fulfillment is that we are called to an unknown, inconceivable land, terra incognita. There is only one voice that will be recognized there because we are already familiar with it here. The voice of the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, verses four through six. Yes, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we have left the shady green pastures. We have left the still waters, the waters of quietude. We've had our souls restored. We have been led in the wagon tracks of righteousness for his name's sake. We have lived in tranquility and now we will experience turbulence, even though, what happened? We were in the meadows. That was lightness. That was placidness. That was peace. And now we are walking through the valley of the shadows of death. How did we get there? I want to tell you that the same one who made us to lie down in green pastures, led us beside still waters, stored our souls, who led us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake, is the same one who leads us into the valley 
of the shadow of death. And you and I have to get used to redemptive reversals. We love laughter, but you have to deal with lamentation. We love singing, but you have to handle sighing. We want to feast all the time, but a time of fasting is coming. And we see the turn in verse 4, even though, do you hear the change of tone there? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I've got to have a religion that's tough enough that can handle the even though transitions and shifts in life. I've got to come to Job 13 and 15. Even though he slays me, yet will I trust him. I've got to be able to say like Daniel, three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In Daniel 3, 19 to 25, where Nebuchadnezzar has made it mandatory that anyone who hears the Babylonian Symphony Orchestra play, that they had to bow down to this golden image of Nebuchadnezzar, and the three boys won't do it. And Nebuchadnezzar wants to give them a second chance to say to them, look, maybe you didn't understand the instruction. This is not optional. This is an imperative. They said, yes, we understand. And we want you to know that our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. It's not a question of his ability, but if not, even though we still won't bow, we need to have the even though toughness of the religion of Habakkuk in Habakkuk chapter three, verses 16 and 17. Even though there are no crops in the field, even though there are no cattle in the stall, even though there are no figs on the tree, even though there are no grapes on the vine, yet will I rejoice in God my Savior, even though. And we should not be surprised with these redemptive reversals, these sanctified shifts. It happened to Jesus. How do you understand this account of his baptism? In Matthew 3, 17, the sun is in the baptismal waters of Jordan. The spirit in the form of a dove sits on his shoulder and the father is amplifying a message of divine approbation from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The Trinity. Next verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Of course, you and I know that in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, there were no chapters and verses, just straight texts. And that next verse says, and Jesus was thrust out into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted of the devil from being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River to being tempted in the wilderness by the devil. And the Spirit is the one who's choreo choreographing and orchestrating it all. Even though I walk through the valley, because at its best, the Christian pilgrimage must be described not as a run or a sprint, not as a flight, but as a walk. I hear Isaiah saying in Isaiah 40, 31, as those exiles make their way back home after being in Babylon for 70 long years, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. But you won't be able really to fly through the valley. Every now and then you'll get a flight, but not too often because valleys are not made to be flown through. Be able to run and not be weary. You'll be able to run a little bit more than you fly. But most of all, Christianity is not a 100-yard dash. It's a walk. Walk and not Saints. That's why you hear the words in Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through. When you pass through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you pass through the fire, it will not burn you. We are going through pass through. The valley is not a place where you set up residence. It's not a place for permanency. Mm. 
Mm. In fact, you can't have a valley unless there are mountains on either side, which means you're not far from your asset when you're dealing with your descent. It's passing through. I've had a lot of problems, questions for tomorrow. There have been so many times that I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation that my trials tend to make me strong. I thank God for my mountains. I thank God for my valleys. I thank God for the times he's brought me through. If I didn't have any problems, how would I know that God could solve them? How would I know what faith in God could do? Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. You are going through. You're not in the valley. You're going through the valley. And we spend a lot of time talking about him being the bright and morning star. That's the up look. That's right. But he's also the lily in the valley. He's with you on the mountain. He's with you in the valley. Yea, though I walk, through the valley of the shadows or the shadow of death. It's a shadow. And don't be overwhelmed by the shadow when you know that you are over, being overshadowed by El Shaddai and his shadow is overshadowing you. How else do you understand Psalm 91, verse 1? He or she who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Most High God. You abide under the shadow. So if it's, if it's over your head, it's under his feet. He's overshadowing you. It's James Russell Law reminds us that you may not always be able to see God, but he sees where you are. Truth forever on the scaffold. Wrong forever on the throne. But the scaffold is swayed. And there is God in the in them unknown, standing, keeping watch above his own. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. But the scaffold sways the future. And behind the dim unknown, behind the dim unknown, stands God in the shadows, keeping watch above his own. It's not really as important for you to know where God is as for God to know where you are. I had a friend of mine, they had their first baby, and the mother and father became attached to the baby to the point that the baby became attached to the parents to the point it was necessary for that baby to sleep between them every night, every single night. And they knew after a while that they would never break the baby so the baby would have his, his this, this, this case, uh, her independence. So it took and put the baby in her own bed, in her own room, and cracked the door. The baby screamed and hollered, and mama wanted to get out of bed and go and rescue the baby, bring the baby back, put the baby in between them. Daddy said, no, just go and look and make sure the baby's all right. And she looked through the little crack and the baby was fine, just screaming and hollering, and finally learned to go to sleep without sleeping between mom and daddy. It's not really that important that you know where God is, but it's really important that God knows where you are. So why should you feel discouraged? Why should the shadow come? Why should your heart be lonely and long for heaven and home if Jesus is your portion? Your constant friend is he. If his eye is on the sparrow, then you know that he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You say you believe in the, in the resurrection. I said that I believe in, in immortality, and I did conceptually. I really, really did. But when we lowered our 34-year-old son into that grave, 
then I knew I believed in the resurrection because there was nothing else for me to believe in. It was no longer just a theological concept. It was a reality. And you and I will never know that Jesus is enough because we sing that song, I've got Jesus and that's enough. But you'll never know that Jesus is enough until you don't have anything left except Jesus. And as long as you have props to lean on, as Carolyn Custis James will say in her book, when life and beliefs collide, she says, when faith is stripped to the bone and all our props and crutches are gone, our knowledge of God that he is good and that he's still on the throne is the only thing that will keep you going. When faith is stripped to the bone, no gristle, no fats, no skin, nothing, just bare faith. When faith is stripped to the bone and all our props and crutches are gone, our health breaks down, their relational rifts, their financial reverses. You have nothing else you can cling to when all our props and crutches are gone. Our knowledge of God that he is good and that he is still on the throne is the only thing that will keep you going. And that is enough to know that he is still in charge. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you are with me. Now, up until this time, the psalmist has been talking about God. <clears throat> Third person. He, the Lord, is my shepherd. He's the shepherd of me. Shall know. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. <clears throat> he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. <clears throat> he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But when he gets in the valley, he's going to talk, stop talking about God and start talking to God. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because <clears throat> you are with me. Your rod, your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. You've got to get to the point <clears throat> where you can sing your theology, not just state it and quote it. You've got to be able to sing it and start talking back to God, not just talk about God. You've got to talk to God. God, this is where I am. I know you're there. I know you're with me. Hold me up. And when Jesus was on that cross, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The cry of forsakenness. He says, I will fear no evil. There are 365 fear nots in the Bible, I'm told. And if there's a fear, if there are 365 fear nots in the Bible, there's a fear not for every day of your life. We have no reason to fear. And this psalmist, the shepherd, keeps the sheep in a state of composure because they know that the shepherd is packing. He's packing your rod, that club-like instrument for any lion, any coyote to come. You want some of this? Come on. Your rods. And then that curved piece of wood, your staff that the shepherd leans on and the shepherd uses to prod the sheep. They bring me comfort. God is our protector. God is our defender. And God is able to rescue us when we've fallen into the ravines and to the gullies and to pull us out. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because you're with me. Your rod, your staff. Just knowing that you're able to defend me, it brings me comfort. Verse 5. Now, we want to get to verse 5 because we want to get to the banquet hall. We want to get to the table land. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with all my cup runs. So we want that. So much so that we want to circumvent, go around verse 4, the valley, and get to verse 5. So we quote it this way. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He was told my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they come to me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
But you can't get to verse 5, the banquet hall, until you've gone through the valley. And all this rinky-dink preaching where we say to individuals, God wants to make life convenient for you. God is not your ecclesiastical red hop. I'm telling you, he's not your theological bell hop. He is not. And God will allow you to go through. In fact, that's the great miracle. We want to get out of trouble. That's not the greatest miracle. It's what we get out of trouble. It's not getting out of trouble, but what do you get out of trouble? What do you learn from trouble? Because if you don't have a test, you can't have a testimony. And one of the great weaknesses in our preaching is we don't have much of a testimony. We're telling folk about what God did for someone else. All we haven't updated our testimony. The Lord blessed me down in Alabama and down in Mississippi where I'm born, Tennessee, 30 years ago. But we ought to bless the Lord at all times. This is the day that the Lord has made. Update your testimony. Tell them about your journey through the valley. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Shepherds would take and oftentimes go ahead of the sheep, come to a place where they, he could bed them down, pull away all the poisonous plants, so that when he brought the sheep to this table land, this place of grazing, they would not be eating poisonous plants. And then he would make sure it would be an area that was safe for them. Hmm. He went before them. You prepare a table before me. Preposition of time. You do it before me. Here's the shepherd going ahead preparing a bedding down place for them, before them. Preposition of location. He prepares a table before me, like panim, my panim in Hebrew, from face to face, before my face. I'm seeing it. The sheep are watching the shepherd, preparing the place right before their face. That's what would happen in Bedouin hospitality. Uh, we've been there in terms of what the better, better when shepherds would do in Abram's time and other time. Uh, sometimes when you get there, they've already prepared the meal. You sit down, they bring it out. And then we've sat there and we've watched them prepare it right before our face. Hmm. You know, that's what God does for us. Sometimes God, preposition of time. Sometimes God takes and does it before you get there. You're worried about like Mary Magdalene and the other women, the question that they had as they went to the tomb on that resurrection Sunday morning, they have a crucifixion mindset. And they don't recognize that it's resurrection Sunday morning in terms of Jesus being raised from the dead. And their big question is, who's going to roll the stone away for us? And when they got there, the stone was already rolled away. And you know what we do? We take and worry because worry is the interest paid upon trouble before it falls due. And sometimes it doesn't fall through. And we just worry and worry and worry. And when we get to that moment, God has already rolled the stone away. Things have already been fixed. It's a preposition of time. He does it in advance. But then before my face can be a preposition of location. He does it before my face. I'm watching him. Has this ever happened to you? Seeing him put things together. You don't know how it's going to eventually work out, but you know he's up to something. I got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. I don't know how. I just have a feeling. I got a holy hunch. And when God nods, we... He does it before my face. He prepares the table before me hmm, in the presence of my enemies, not in the absence of it. And David certainly knew that this happened with sheep. When predators were all around, since he was packing and was ready to defend them, he could go on and prepare the table land while he held his weapon close at hand. 
David was always under the threat of death. Hear him in 1 Samuel 20, verse 3. There's only one step between me and death. Wow! One step between me and death because Saul was always chasing him. Saul invited him for dinner and tried to make him a wall hanging with a spear. And because of his dexterity and ability, he was able to escape, but it really was God. Death always close at hand. But there's a step between me and death. And what gets in between me and death is grace. Why do we keep singing that unless we believe it? Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. It was grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us on. I just think when we get to heaven and God rolls back the curtains of memory, shows us where he's brought us from and where we could have been had it not been for his grace, that we will shout and worship even more. In fact, we ought to shout and worship even now when we think about the dangers known and seen that he's brought us through. And so he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And what David is saying here is, God will feed you and bless you in the wilderness banquet hall and send reserve box seat ticket invitations to your enemies. And they will watch you get blessed, watch you eat, and they can't do anything about it. Watch you get promoted, and they can't do anything about it. They want to pull the rug out from under you, but they don't understand that there is one that's under the rug that's holding you up, your marriage up, your family up, your health up. Mm. He prepares a table before me in the presence, not the absence of my enemies. You don't have to vindicate yourself. You don't have to defend yourself. You didn't call yourself. That's the problem. If you called yourself and praised yourself, there's a problem. But when God calls you and defends you, then God will take care of you while you're there. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head mm, with oil. My head, my head with oil. Uh, the shepherd would take sweet-smelling oil and pour it on the head of the sheep because the sheep had been bitten by pests and insects. Uh, those bites irritated them. Not mauling of coyotes and lions, but you know, the irritation of ticks, the bites of pests and insects, so irritated. And that oil would flow down the head all the way down to their feet, covered it, relieved them. It provided a sense of calmness. Now they could rest. That's what God does for us. He relieves us of irritation. It's not necessarily going to be those big things that are, going, that are going to hurt you as much as little bites from people. You know, little insect bites, pest bites, things that keep nagging you all the time. Attitudes, the unwillingness to grow. Those individuals who don't say anything, but those individuals who don't do anything. Uh, on and on, those bites. And, and he has a way of relieving you with his spirit. The oil is a symbol or an emblem of the spirit of God. You anoint my head with oil. I can't even contain it. My cup runs over. Let me finish. Surely. That's the word for yes. Christ is the amen of God. And the Holy Spirit is the amen of Christ. Surely, Tob and Hesed. Surely, goodness and Hesed. Tob is goodness. Mercy in this sense, Hesed is God's loyal covenant love. Mm, follow after me. Do you understand, Robert Smith, what, what Hesed is? It's unconditional. It's not contractual. God is not a contractual God. God doesn't say, now, nah, here's a contract in terms of your deliverance, in terms of your salvation. You do 50%. If you do that, I'll do my 50%. Mm -hmm. Do what God says. 
I'm doing it all. If you're not faithful, I'm faithful. All you have to do is go back and look at Genesis 15 one more time. This covenant that God made with Abram at that time, his non-covenantal name, where all of the animals, the birds are split in two and all this blood flowing. And God takes and walks through the animals. And Abram is asleep, which means he's not even involved. God is saying, if I don't keep my promise made to you, eventually 400 years, your descendants will go into captivity in the land. He's talking about Egypt. I'm going to bring them out and on and on and on and keep my promise that I made in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the serpent shall bruise the seed, seed of the woman's heel. Talking about Christ. But the seed of the woman shall bruise the seed of the serpent's head, which is a mortal blow. Then let me be cut up. Put me to the test. That's what he asked in Malachi 3 and 10. Try me. Put me to the test. And I'll Obviously, Abraham is not involved in keeping it because he's asleep. And God promises he will keep the covenant based upon his own true self. That's what ought to spur us. This, is, this should not spur us to slowfulness. It ought to spur us to activity. We are not working for salvation. We're working from salvation. We're not working to be saved. We're working because we are saved. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, the love of Christ constrains me. It propels me. That's why I work. I love him, as John would say, because he first loved me. Goodness and mercy. Mm, wait a minute. David follows after me. Mm, I've had goodness and mercy as God's sheepdog walking beside me. Huh, he says, after me. Mm. That means that the shepherd would have someone up front to protect the sheep while the sheepdogs of goodness and mercy followed the sheep to make sure that those nibblers who would go off the path would stay on the right path. Do you understand, Robert Smith, that God not only has an advance guard, but he has a rear guard. Someone to walk, some persons, some graces to walk behind us. When I look back on my life, I can see wrong decisions, sin, mistakes, strong in my pathway. I look back now. But when I stand before God, when he shall come with trumpet sound, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And when God says, look behind you, and I look behind, and I don't see any sin, blameless, faultless, guiltless, and I want to ask God, what happened to my sin? I know that my sin filled my pathway. Didn't you believe me when I told you goodness and mercy shall follow after you, cleaning up after you, picking up after you, sweeping away all of that so that when we stand before him, nothing in our hand we bring. Simply to the cross we cling. Goodness and mercy shall follow us to the end of our days, as the Hebrew would say, all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is David's desire. He says it in Psalm 27, verse 4. This one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I follow after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Just one thing. I think preachers... And preachers' wives need to be one thingified, one, to be like Paul who says in Philippians 3.13 and 3.14, I am not perfect, I have not apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind, and reading forth the things that are before, I press toward the mark, the prize of high calling of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just one thing. That was the problem with the rich young ruler. You lack one thing. Sell all you have and give to the poor, then you come and follow me. 
That was the problem with those ecclesiastical bosses. They were thinking about so many things. And this blind man says in John 9, 25, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know, but this one thing I know, whereas I was blind, now I see. Just one thing. I just want to dwell in God's house to behold his beauty and to inquire in his temple. And he comes to the close of the song by saying that I want to take and go to the house of the Lord and be there forever. The psalm opens up with the shepherd coming to our house. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, my house. It ends with the sheep going to his house. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And Helmut Tilica says, when we get there, there will be just one voice that will be heard. And we will recognize that voice because we are familiar with it here. The voice of the Good Shepherd. At Beeson Divinity School, we had an outstanding student. His name was Rick McLean. Smart, witty, pastor of the church, wonderful father, wonderful husband, excellent preacher. But he has never heard one syllable ever. He can't hear. And he stood up in chapel and he preached, speaking to men. He said, I have an advantage over all of you. Because one of these days, the first voice that I will ever hear will be the voice of my Savior. I've never heard mom and daddy talk. I've never heard one sermon. But when I see Jesus, I will hear his voice. Say amen and say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. If when you give, I leave you with this, the best of your service, telling the world that the Savior has come, be not dismayed when friends don't believe you. He will understand and say, well done. Misunderstood, the Savior of sinners. He hung on the cross. He was God's only son. Can't you hear him calling his Father in heaven? Not my will, but thine be done. Misunderstood, the Savior of sinners. He hung on the cross. He was God's only son. Can't you see his hands scarred? And can't you hear him calling? Not my will, but thine be done. Oh, when I come to the end of my journey, weary of life and the battle is won, carrying the staff and the cross of redemption, he will understand and say, well, 